so the subject is, is social justice, fairness, and uh, I guess we've all grown used to uh, looking at pictures like this on the television when we're, uh, we're asked to contribute money. And you know, one of the questions is for economists, especially for finance experts, is why do we do it? We might not do it very much, but we do it. And um, my wife and I contribute quite large amounts, and uh, she sometimes uh, challenges me, you know, how do I justify this given my, my uh, evil economic background? Um, but this, this raises various questions. You know, we, we talk a lot, what is socially just? You know, is, is this arrangement fair? Is that arrangement fair? Um, a political scientist, Jan Elster, uh, was famously asked by the Swedish government to study uh, wage bargaining in Sweden. And you know, in Sweden, they don't, um, they don't bargain by saying, you know, I want uh, you know, $10.74 an hour. The other guy says, uh, no, no, you can only have 9.37. What they say is, um, the unions say, um, I propose this definition of fairness. And the other side say, no, I propose this definition of fairness. And he counted 24 different definitions of fairness which have been proposed in uh, wage negotiations in Sweden. So how do we achieve social justice? Uh, uh, question not much asked, how much justice is compatible with human nature? And you'll find people in Chicago who say, none at all. There is no such thing as justice. And uh, I hope to show you that that's not so. And uh, why do we care about social justice? It's a much more difficult question. And uh, I think you know, the way to make sense of that question is to ask, well, where do fairness norms come from? You know, how come we care about fairness? Is it a cultural phenomenon? Is it a biological phenomenon? Uh, no other species seem to care about fairness. Uh, how come our species cares about fairness? Um, you know, by and large, philosophers like to give um, metaphysical answers to this question. And so this, this slide I've got here, if there are philosophers in the room, they won't very likely be very pleased. So this is a, a picture of a vampire bat. And there, there really are vampire bats. Uh, this is indeed a picture of a vampire bat. Uh, they live in caves in um, Central America. And um, uh, you know, during the day, they sleep in very large numbers. And at night, they come out and they, they look for an animal to suck blood from. And they really need the blood. If they, if they can't get blood within about 60 hours, they're probably dead. So the evolutionary pressure to share food, uh, to ensure each other against hunger, is very strong in vampire bats. And uh, they do indeed share blood. Um, there's a, I haven't got really time to uh, talk at length about this, but the biologist Wilkinson has a, a great website where you can actually see videos of the, of the a vampire bat sharing blood. Basically what happens if, uh, is uh, uh, bats that roost, that sleep in the, in the same part of the cave, if one of them comes back and it um, is hungry, it goes and begs for blood from a, a neighboring bat. And you can tell the bats sort of found blood because they're kind of bloated with it like this. And, um, and if, that, if the bat from whom it begs blood has given the begging bat blood in the past, it's quite likely to be given blood. So what happens is the bat with blood regurgitates the blood and the hungry bat laps it up. Biological things are always unpleasant. You know, it's part of, part of the way the world is. So what I'm saying here is that you know, bats have their way of sharing. And you know, I, I choose vampire bats rather than wolves or... Um, African hunting dogs or all of the other uh, uh, animal species that share food because bats apparently share blood uh, with non-relatives. You don't have to be a relative to get, the, uh, to get blood, whereas um, you know, with wolves and the like, they're all related to each other. So bats have their way of sharing and we have our way of sharing. And the, the proposition that I'm defending here is that uh, our way of sharing, the way of sharing that evolved in our species, our name for that is fairness. And if some other way of sharing had evolved in our species, we'd probably have a word for it. It might be fairness again, but it wouldn't be the same kind of fairness. We have our way of sharing, other species have their ways of sharing. We call our way of sharing fairness. 
Now, what do what philosophers say? Of course, philosophers say a very great deal. And, um, but the, you know, the standard uh, line is, is, is the metaphysical line that I'm representing here just by Plato and Immanuel Kant. But you know, they could, I, I could have hundreds of philosophers who contribute to the metaphysical approach to morals. And um, what I'm saying is all of that effort wasted. All of that effort wasted. Uh, and, uh, but it doesn't mean that the, um, you know, everything the guys say is wasted because they have bad foundations. And I, I'm going to draw attention to the book of John Hassani. This is the John Hassani who won the Nobel Prize for his theory of um, incomplete information. And uh, this is John Rawls, who was um, arguably the greatest moral philosopher of the 20th century. He was a wonderful man. If everybody were like John Rawls, he wouldn't need any morality. Okay. Whereas Hassan, he needed quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of looking after. If you know what I mean. Now, uh, there's a respectable tradition for uh, uh, the science of morals, which is what I'm trying to sell you here. So I claim Aristotle. I could claim Epicurus. This is the great David Hume, and in my opinion, the greatest <coughs> philosopher of all time. And uh, I've got to include Adam Smith. Um, who wasn't at all like the Adam Smith of the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, his his, um, his yeah. work on moral philosophy is probably, he, he probably thought it was in, as important as the wealth of, wealth of nations. And in modern times, um, there are quite a number of contemporary philosophers who, who, who've taken up this line. This was the first. This is John Mackey, very bravely wrote this book, Ethics. And I don't know if you can see the subtitle, which is Inventing Right and Wrong. You know, a deliberately provocative title, inventing right and wrong. It's not that right and wrong, he says, is um, somehow given to us in some um, platonic um, uh, limbo, but um, we invent right and wrong. And I don't think he's completely right about that, because I think you know, part, of, part of our uh, sense of right and wrong comes with our bodies. It's built into our genes. But, the other half of what I want to say agrees with John Mackey. Yes, culture matters enormously to what we count as right and wrong, but it's not the only thing that counts. Um, so I'm going to come back to John Hassani and John Rawls because I'm going to steal some of their clothes along the way. Basically, I steal from John Rawls um, his notion of the, um, of the veil of ignorance, which I, uh, the original position of the veil of ignorance, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And from John Hassani, I, I steal his theory of interpersonal comparison. Okay, so John Mackey's in inventing right and wrong. He spends the uh, first half of the book denouncing metaphy metaphysical moral philosophy. So one by one, he takes the various arguments that the uh, metaphysicians offer in defense of their way of thinking about things, and he demolishes them one by one. And I, I, I really can't see how someone can read this book read his arguments and, and not be convinced. But people do. And uh, the second half of his book is not so successful. He says, um, if we want a science of uh, science, scientific moral philosophy, then um, where should we look for our data? You can't have a scientific theory without data. And he says, look to anthropology for your data. And uh, the second thing he says, this is what first warmed my heart to him, being a game theorist. He says the framework, the scientific framework we need is, is game theory. But when he was writing, game theory wasn't nearly so well developed. There was no evolutionary game theory, for example, and so he just burbles. But uh, uh, now we can supply what he wasn't able to supply. So uh, let me th talk about anthropology first. So I'm going to do anthropology in five minutes. And I actually, three weeks ago, I did anthropology in five minutes to an audience of anthropologists. And they were very, very patient, very patient. And um, now, we're, first, we're talking about pure hunter-gatherers. You've got to go back at least 10,000 years, some people say 12,000 years before agriculture. And in those times, um, uh, human beings existed, and they uh, had existed for a very long time. And, uh, and before agriculture, it seems that they lived uh, as hunter-gatherers for um, uh, hundreds of thousands of years, possibly millions of years. 
and presumably in very much the same way. And I'm emphasizing pure hunter-gatherers because there are no uh, pure hunter-gatherers anymore. Uh, there were 40 years ago, you know, there were just about 20 years ago, there are none anymore. So all of the data we have on pure hunter-gatherers is historical. And their social contracts, by which I mean the way they organize themselves, uh, are amazingly universal. Everywhere you look, uh, everywhere you look at the surviving, the, the hunter-gatherers who survived into the current century, you find very similar social contracts. And I should have said that you know, these are groups of about 60 odd. They range from 30 to about 120. You, you don't find groups bigger than that. Right? They mix with neighboring groups, but, uh, or they interact with neighboring groups, but you know, 60 is quite a large group. And their social contracts have two universal properties, no bosses. So there's, there's no chief. There might be someone called the chief, um, but uh, that person doesn't regard himself or anybody else as entitled to tell anybody else what to do. And the, uh, the uh, <coughs> hunter-gatherer groups have uh, social mechanisms for um, disincentivizing uh, bossy behavior, dominance behavior. Because you know, they, they, their genes are essentially the same as ours, so they have the same urge to dominate, to try and be in charge. But it's very unwise if you're you know, a big guy with muscles uh, to try and dominate because um, you will be punished. And there's kind of three levels of punishment, which I always enjoy because they're so like academic punishments. You know? And the first one is uh, if, you, if you try to be bossy, to tell people what to do, people laugh at you. And it's the same when, uh, in academic life, you know, if you have a new idea and you present it uh, to an audience like this, the first thing that happens is everybody laughs. You know? It's a kind of nervous giggle, uh, 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 greets any, any new thought. The next thing that happens is, um, is uh, people stop talking to the guy who's behaving badly, you get ostracized. And uh, what happens in academic life is they won't publish your papers. And then the third stage is you get expelled from the group, in which you'll probably die, because either you're a part of a group, you, you, it's very hard to survive on your own in these circumstances. So unless some other group will take you in, that's it. And of course, you lose your tenure in academic life. Um, anyway, that's, um, oh, and the number two, very important number two, is uh, fair division. So these groups uh, uh, share in a way that we would regard as very fair, very fairly, especially meat. You know, when the boys go out and they come back and they've, they've hunted some large animal perhaps, and you know, in prehistoric times, uh, these groups hunted very large animals. They used to hunt mammoths, for example. Um, the meat is divided very fairly. Um, we wouldn't like living in one of these societies because they're so fair that we would find it oppressive. I remember one um, anthropologist report of um, Kalahari Bushman, and the, uh, the uncle he was talking to had spent several days making a beautiful tool. And he used this tool for a few days, and then he gave it to somebody else. And the anthropologist said, why did you give this tool to somebody else? And he said, I can't keep it because uh, I will be the object of envy. People will say it isn't fair that I have this beautiful tool, so I have to give it to someone else. Why did you give it to um, Auntie so-and-so? And I have to give it to Auntie so-and-so, and then you get a long, long history of who owes what to whom, so it will be fair. I mean, the, the fairness is obsessive in these, in these societies sometimes. So here I've got some uh, pure hunter-gatherers. Um, uh, <coughs> these are Arche, these were the last, the Arche Indians of Paraguay. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, they, they, they don't live like this anymore. This is a, 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 an Inuit from uh, Greenland. Uh, this little girl is an Australian Aborigine. And this is a Kalahari Bushman that I was talking about. And you know, I've chosen them because they come from far corners of the world. Uh, how come their social contracts are so similar? 
And I, I think there's a good reason why their social contracts are, are so similar. It's because their way of doing things is written in our genes. Okay. Uh, like I say, it's not everything that they do is written in their genes, but uh, part of the way they organize themselves is, is written in their genes. Now, uh, that was the end of anthropology, and now we do game theory. And the pro vice chancellor uh, was uh, saying about my part in uh, organizing the, the big auction that made $35 billion. And it actually, it wasn't the biggest auction ever. I know we have a paper with that title. But the biggest auction ever was when the, um, the Praetorian, Praetorian Guard uh, auctioned off the Roman Empire. And uh, he didn't last long. He, he lasted about three months as emperor. Um, Anyway, here, here I'm going to do game theory again in five minutes. So I'm going to show you two little games and some more. Every, everybody's heard of the prisoner's dilemma. And the stag hunt game is a, a game which is derived from uh, a story in uh, Jean, a philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a book called, um, or at least it, which is referred to as The Inequality of Man. And this is a story that he tells. So Adam is one of the players. And he has two strategies, and I'll call them dove being nice and hawk being nasty. So he chooses a row. Eve, uh, she chooses a column, and she, in this simple case, she can choose to be nice, be like a dove, or be like a hawk and be nasty. And uh, so those are the player's strategies. And here are uh, Adam's payoffs. This is what Adam gets. Now, of course, in, the, in auctions, it's money. But in these applications, um, it's biological fitness. It's uh, how many kids you get on average as a consequence of the way you play. Okay, so this is biological fitness. And uh, so this is Adams. Uh, you shouldn't take that too literally. These numbers are proportional to the average number of kids you get. And um, here are Eve's payoffs. And when we put it all together, uh, we get uh, two games. So here are two games. And um, how do we analyze these games? And uh, um, the first thing one does is to look for best replies. So why have I circled this three? Well, if the other guy, if, if Eve was to play Dove, I could, I'm Adam, I could get a two or I could get a three. Three is bigger than two, so I put a circle around the three. And here, you know, one is bigger than zero, so I put a one a circle around the one. Here, three is bigger than two, so I put a circle around the three. And um, the, where you see a, a place where both payoffs are circled, that, that's here, and here, and here, and here. These are, these are all Nash equilibria. So you probably heard of, um, this is John Nash. Um, this is the famous John Nash who was uh, a hero of the movie. This, this, I've forgotten his name. Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. And um, actually, I was having dinner with John Nash and his wife, the saintly Alicia. And um, they'd just come back from seeing the rushes of the movie. And I asked them, um, you know, how did they like the movie? And they said, the movie's fantastic. The movie's wonderful. <coughs> and, um, and the reason is that you know, Russell Crowe is very good looking. And so John Nash was quite pleased about that. And the woman who plays Alicia, she is astonishing. I can't remember her name. But Alicia was so delighted. You know. And I said, you know, but did they get the notion of a Nash equilibrium right? And he said, oh, he didn't notice. He didn't notice. <laughs> so um, so here, are, here are the Nash equilibria. See, the prisoner's dilemma only has one Nash equilibrium. And for many, many years, when I started in game theory, uh, almost all discussion is, you know, how can this be the solution of the prisoner's dilemma when everybody would be better off to play Dove? And the answer is that um, uh, if you're looking for the rational solution of a game, it must be a Nash equilibrium. You know, if you could write down the ration, rational solution of a game, um, you could write it in a book. And anybody could go and look in the book, and then they would, you would know what the other guy was going to do, if he was going to do a rational thing. And so it would be stupid of you not to play the best reply to what you know the other guy is going to do. But if both players do it, it's a Nash equilibrium. 
So if, the rational, if you can identify the rational solution of a game, which you can't always do, it must be a Nash equilibrium. But that's not what's interesting here. What's interesting here is the evolutionary, um, the evolutionary uh, interpretation of a Nash equilibrium. So if you have an evolutionary process, <coughs> nature red in tooth and claw, um, there'll be a process. <coughs> You know, if one strategy is successful in one generation, there'll be more people playing that strategy in the next generation. And if you keep turning that handle, looking ahead to the next generation, and if the process isn't too uh, noisy, and if the payoffs actually represent fitness like I'm describing, then the evolution can only stop, it's gonna stop at all, it must stop at a Nash equilibrium. And you know, this is actually how uh, evolutionary biology is so, game theory is so successful in evolutionary biology because um, it means the biologists don't have to follow through you know, each twist and turn of an evolutionary process. They can say, we, we don't have to know um, what happened last Saturday or how many lizards there were in this pool uh, last Wednesday. Um, they say, um, well, if this process goes on long enough, it'll end up as though all the animals were playing rationally. And so they can short circuit all the difficulties of um, studying evolutionary processes this way. And, and they do, and it's very successful. However, there's a big problem with this story, which is like in the stag hunt, there are two equilibria. In fact, there are three equilibria. There's one in mixed strategies, which I, I won't tell you about right now. And um, there's a good equilibrium where everyone will get four, and there's a bad equilibrium where everyone will get two. And what Rousseau, well, this is how game theorists interpret Rousseau, they say that, well, Rousseau was saying, well, suppose we were trapped in this social contract, because, you know, to be stable, uh, a social contract must be an equilibrium of the game of life that uh, the group is playing. You know, if it's not an equilibrium, it won't be stable. If it isn't stable, it won't survive. So mere survival requires of a social contract that it correspond to an equilibrium of the game of life of the group that we're talking about. And here we've got a very simple game of life, but nevertheless, there are two equilibria. And if a group found itself at this bad equilibrium, how would it get to the good equilibrium? Is there a way that it can happen? Yeah. And, um, here are some more examples, um, but these examples illustrate that that's a very difficult question, or can be. This is the driving game. If you've got a car, if you drive to work in the morning, you know, every, every, every morning you play the driving game. You can drive on the left or you can drive on the right. And uh, if everybody drives on the left, that's one equilibrium. And if everybody drives on the right, it's another equilibrium. And we all know that some countries use this equilibrium and other countries use that equilibrium. And I remember uh, saying this to an audience in Turkey and, uh, and I pointed out that there's a third equilibrium where people drive half the time on the left and half the time on the right, you know, choosing it by tossing a coin. Right? And uh, this is a bad equilibrium. You know, it's it's uh, not very satisfactory. Actually, you know, the reason I mentioned Turkey is because people said, uh, and I said, nobody uses that equilibrium. And the audience said, you haven't been in Turkey very long. <laughs> and I, I, after a while I understood, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's, it's not that people drive at random, it's just that you can't, you can't tell which way they're coming or where they're coming from. You know, Moscow isn't so different. And um, so I suppose we were at the Turkish equilibrium. Uh, then everyone would agree, yes, look, um, it would be much better if we all drove on the left or if we all drove on the right. And then there isn't a problem because um, uh, if we could agree to do it, just like Sweden in the 1960s switched from driving on the left to driving on the right. And they did it in the early hours of the morning so that nobody would, would be awake. But the Swedes tell me that lots of people got up to see what would happen and drove their cars in the early hours of the morning to the time when they switch from left to right. But what do we have? This game is called The Battle of the Sexes. And this dates before female emancipation, and I'm not responsible for the title. So there's a husband and a wife, and uh, they can choose, they, they've been, they're on their honeymoon, they've been separated in the big city of New York, 
And at breakfast they discussed whether in the evening they would go boxing or whether they would go to the ballet. And the stereotype is that the husband prefers the boxing and the wife prefers the ballet. Not in my family. My wife, will, my wife loves, loves uh, contact sports. And she won't allow me to watch the ballet at all. You know, it's, it's not manly. Uh, so you notice there's two equilibria. They could both go boxing. And it's better for the husband than it is for the wife. The husband here and the wife there. Or they could go to the ballet, which is better for the wife than for the husband. Uh, there's a mixed equilibrium, again, you know, a bad equilibrium, where they choose at random, not half-half in this case, but it doesn't matter what the probabilities are. Um, so how would they resolve this problem? How would they decide you know, whether they should do this or whether they should do that? And uh, if there's no way to break symmetry, there's no answer to the question. So Harold Kuhn invented this game precisely for that reason. If this had been our game of life, the battle of the sexes, even the simplest game like this, I do not think we would have evolved as social animals. And, uh, but it isn't, our game of life isn't any, anywhere like that. You know, when we interact with other human beings, you know, it isn't just once, once off. You interact with people, um, especially if you're in a hunter-gatherer group, you interact with the same people on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, and into the indefinite future. And the analysis of a repeated game, um, like that here, I've got the repeated prisoner's dilemma, but it could be any game repeated like this. The analysis of the in indefinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma isn't anything like the one-shot prisoner's dilemma that I showed you earlier. Um, and um, here is this, this strategy for the prisoner's dilemma is called the Grimm strategy. And uh, I'll explain it. You start here. And this says, start by playing dove. Start by being nice. If the other guy is nice, stay being nice. But if ever the other guy is nasty and plays hawk, switch to hawk yourself and don't, don't move from that. Okay? So you can think of this as, um, uh, you can think of this as, uh, this is the punishment. What people are supposed to do in this equilibrium is to be nice and play dove all the time. But if anyone deviates, the, the strategy says, punish that person forever, which is why it's called the grim strategy, because it's a grim punishment. Now, if both players uh, use the grim strategy in the repeated prisoner's dilemma, they'll play dove all the time. So they'll get the good equilibrium. There'll be a payoff of two on Monday, two on Tuesday, two, or two on Wednesday, and forever. And the reason that nobody cheats and tries to uh, do better because remember, you can get three by playing hawk if the other guy plays dove, but you won't do that because the other guy will respond by punishing you forever. So we've got a Nash equilibrium here of the indefinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma in which everybody cooperates all of the time. Uh, it's called um, uh, reciprocal altruism. This is a name invented by, for it by the biologist um, Robert Trivers. And um, so it's quite big in, in biology, this notion. I got, something, I got one, I'll just show you one example. If I had time, I would tell you about the Antwerp diamond market. But this, this is a quote from the New York um, antiques market. I found this in the New York Times. The, the journalist asked um, uh, a scout. A scout is someone who goes out into the Midwest and tries to find rocking chairs and stuff like that, which are very popular in um, fancy people in New York City. So he brings his um, rocking chairs and his spinning wheels and stuff back. And uh, then he has an antique dealer sell them on commission. So he comes back to the shop and he says, oh, I see you've sold my rocking chair. What did you get for it? Now, why does the antique dealer tell the truth? Okay, the antique dealer is going to pay a commission. Uh, and so his interest is to uh, minimize the amount he sold it for. So the journalist asks, you know, sure, I trust him. You know the ones to trust in this business, the ones who betray you, bye-bye. You know, bye-bye is baby talk for goodbye. You know. So you're never going to interact with that person again. David Hume describes the same, um, the same strategy in his, um, his treatise on human nature. So we've known all about this since 1739. Um, 
Now, in game theory, we, we generalize that result. Um, and uh, the theorem is called the Folk Theorem, because after John Nash proved the theorem that won him his Nobel Prize, which was published in 1951, uh, lots of, well, I don't know lots, but several game theorists uh, invented this theorem. And Bob Allman, another Nobel Prize winner, went round um, asking people, do you know this theorem? And everyone he asked said yes. And uh, so he, he said, well, we'll call this the Folk Theorem. So here, you know, here is, this might be, this might represent any game. I haven't got strategies in this picture, but I've got Adam's payoff here, I've got Eve's payoff there. And this white region is the set of uh, payoff pairs um, uh, that the players could get by using uh, their strategies. If we allowed them to, their pairs of strategies to vary over all the possibilities, we would, we would um, get this payoff region. And this is where we are now. <coughs> So it says current equilibrium. And what the folk theorem says, is, um, well, a simplified version says, um, if that's an equilibrium, if that's where we are now, that payoff pair is obtained in equilibrium, then everything which gives both players more than that is also an equilibrium outcome. So in particular, like this might be the Turkish, the Turkish, the correspond to the, uh, the Turkish equilibrium. And here, this might be everyone drive on the left, everyone drive on the right, but in the repeated case, we've got all these intermediate possibilities. So evolution had a problem when she was creating us. Um, uh, you, know, you know, here, this white region might represent new opportunities, but we're programmed to do this. Well, I think she taught us to do, or, um, she built into us the capacity to get from a bad equilibrium to a good equilibrium quickly. Not to have to wait for a biological evolution to do it for us, but she taught us how to do this quickly. So she had to solve the equilibrium selection problem because it's no use telling us we ought to coordinate on one of these because you know, someone might coordinate on this or someone might coordinate and let everybody drive on the left Somebody else coordinates on let everybody drive on the right, and then there's a crash. So we all got to coordinate on the same thing. So nature had to solve an equilibrium selection problem. And uh, her way of solving the equilibrium selection problem is what we call fair. This is what I'm claiming. If um, nature had not chosen this point, but say that point, we'd call that fair instead. And then we'd have philosophers who would give you metaphysical reasons why that is the only right and proper thing to call fair. Um, so fairness is evolution's solution to the equilibrium selection problem. Just like, uh, I think this is Paris, like driving on the right is the French solution to the, the um, equilibrium selection problem in the driving game. And this is Tokyo, and driving on the left is the Japanese solution to the uh, equilibrium selection problem in the driving game. And people say to me, um, is that all morality is? Like driving on the left or driving on the right? And the answer is no, of course it isn't. Huh? Because the driving game is a very simple game. And the game of life that we play is a very complicated game. And uh, so there's a great deal more to uh, this theory than that. Uh, and here is, here is um, one of the things that philosophers particularly dislike. So fairness therefore evolved as a means of balancing power. So equilibrium means equi, means equal, and librium is from you know, the same as libra, the scales. So equally weighted, okay, evenly balanced is basically what equilibrium means. So fairness therefore evolved as a means of balancing power and not as a substitute for power. You think people would read history books and, and you know, just observe in human history, it doesn't do any good to say of something, uh, look, uh, see how unfair this is. All these guys are doing badly, and all these guys are doing well. You know. Can't we do something about it? Waste your time. Uh, only people whose hands are near the levers of power can do anything. So um, you know, before anything can happen, before slavery can be abolished, and all of these things, you've got to persuade people with power 
And all of us have a little bit of power. And when we get together, we've got a lot of power. But uh, you know, to pretend that the power doesn't matter is, is, is uh, empty. If you want to reform the world, you, know, you cannot ignore power. Now, I don't know how much time I've got now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll rush through this. Okay. And I'll speak a bit about reform at the end. So I, I want to say a little bit about my, my, my theory. As with, as with language, fairness, so I claim, has a deep structure that is universal in the human species. So um, people, have, people have started to criticize Chomsky on deep structure. People have started to say there is no deep structure. Uh, but if you're inclined to believe that, uh, read what these people say. Look at their evidence and then compare it with Chomsky's evidence. Uh, but I think uh, there is deep structure in language and there's also deep structure in uh, fairness. And my theory says this deep structure is embedded in John Rawls' original position. And I've got time, I think, to explain this. John Rawls' original position. This is, a, this, is, um, this is a picture of justice. And you notice she's got a blindfold. She's got a pair of scales for... Um, well, she's got a pair of scales and she's got a sword. And uh, John Rawls calls this veil of it, this, this blindfold the veil of ignorance. And this is to, these scales are there to compare welfare and the sword is for enforcement. So the people who built this, put this statue on top of the Old Bailey in London, they knew perfectly well that justice needs a sword. So this is what game theory has got to, um, to add to Rawls' theory is, is enforcement. Now, what about the, the veil of ignorance? So I haven't got time to talk about the scales, which I borrow from Hassani how to do that. But the veil of ignorance, Hassani talks about that as well, but um, I'm using Rawls' version here. And uh, here are Adam and Eve. And um, they're not completely naked, though you probably can't tell from where you're sitting. And um, they're discussing, um, here I'm taking Rawls' position, they're discussing their marriage contract. What would be a fair marriage contract? And um, what, what Rawls says is that um, in order to decide a question like that, they should uh, imagine themselves behind a veil of ignorance. And what the veil of ignorance conceals from them is uh, who they are. So uh, when they go behind the veil of ignorance, or imagine themselves behind the veil of ignorance, Adam, I'm calling Adam John here, this is John von Neumann, and Eve, I'm calling Oscar for Oscar Morgenstern, the two founders of game theory. And in this state of ignorance, we have to imagine them, um, we have to imagine them bargaining about what social contract, what marriage contract to operate when they come out from behind the veil of ignorance. And the idea is that um, if neither of them know who is going to be whom, uh, neither will want to uh, agree to a situation where one of the parties is disadvantaged because they themselves might be the disadvantaged party. And uh, usually when people hear this for the first time, uh, they're quite enthusiastic. The younger they are, the more enthusiastic they are. And um, they say, yes, yes, that's, that, that's, that's got it right, because it captures the, um, it captures the uh, response to do as you would be done by. The golden rule is do as you would be done by. It captures the objection to do as you would be done by, that um, don't, to, don't do to me as you would have me do to you because I don't have the same tastes as yours. Like my wife has taken to getting up very early in the morning and going swimming. And uh, I don't care for that. You know, I don't care to be woken and say, come swimming with me, which she has done on a number of occasions. Uh, I prefer to lie in bed for a while and get up later. You know? so, um, but the original position takes account of this. Now, I haven't got time for this, so very, very quickly. So I think the origin of, the, um, origin of our notions of fairness is um, with implicit insurance contracts. So uh, you know, an economist would say of the arrangements that vampire bats have got is that they're insuring each other against hunger. The insurance contracts are not real contracts, but you know, they exist as equilibria in the repeated game that vampire bats play. And the implicit is because they don't write anything down and they don't have lawyers. But basically, they're insuring each other against hunger. And if you ask what's involved in that, well, a bat has to be wired up so that, uh, implicitly at least, 
it says, um, you know, um, Adam the bat, perhaps I'm Eve the bat, and Adam the bat and I are going to go out and look for blood. And uh, if both of us find blood, well, there's no problem. If neither of us find blood, there's nothing to share. So the only cases of interest is one of us finds blood and the other doesn't. And then the question is, um, how much? How much blood do you give? And, uh, and in considering that situation, you've got to say, well, I might be the lucky bat, or I might be the unlucky bat. And if you think about that, that's very close to what uh, Rawls describes as the part of the original position. So John says, you know, I might be Adam, I might be Eve, I don't know which. So if we're wired up for implicit insurance contracts, well, we're pretty much wired up for original position. Uh, I spend uh, 30 or 40 pages on this in my book, but I, I pass on from there. Now, both Hassani and Rawls uh, consider the original position. And uh, Hassani uh, deduces that we should be utilitarians. And uh, Rawls deduces that we should be egalitarians. So who's right? Who's right? And um, my theory says, well, if there's external enforcement, for example, if we separate the government uh, from the rest of us, and we treat the government as not players in the game, but game masters who enforce the rules, um, then we ought to be utilitarians. So if, if I, God forbid, that I am asked to design a tax system, but if I were asked to design a tax system, I would treat the government as a benign uh, enforcer, and I would, I would operate in a utilitarian way, following Hassani. But uh, that couldn't have happened in um, evolution, because where's the external enforcement? There is no external enforcement. Um, so everything must be, if, if everything's self-policing, we're led to an egalitarian outcome. Uh, and I wish I had time to show you the, uh, the, the, uh, the arguments, but I don't. So, you know, utilitarianism has to go, and uh, we're left with egalitarianism. I, I this, treat this as a criticism of Hassani, but it's more a criticism of Rawls, because the way Rawls argues, he should have been a utilitarian, but his intuition was better than his analysis, in my, in my opinion. Um, what kind of egalitarianism? And, uh, and here, I didn't know this at the time I was working on this originally, but um, in psychology, there's a, a, a small group of psychologists who um, promote what they call modern equity theory. It's called modern because Aristotle said, what is fair is what is proportional. So what they do, um, if anyone's interested, I can give references, uh, and their work is completely empirical, don't have any theory. Um, you know, we have a status quo, which is you know, where we are now, our current equilibrium in my, my theory. And then you ask people, you know, suppose you could choose anything, say, from this white region, um, what would you say is fair? And people give answers, you know, and, 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 and you know, here's um, one possible answer. And what would you say was fair if you could choose anywhere in this region? And they give an answer and an answer. And these, by and large, these answers lie on a straight line. Um, so, you know, um, <clears throat> each of these guys, because they lie on a, stri a straight line, you know, what everybody gets is proportional to some constant, some fixed constant. And these fixed constants are termed by the slope of this line. And where does this slope come from? And what the psychologists insist on, very, very strongly insist on, is that the slope of this line, um, it depends on context dependent, well, I call them social indices, usually they call them worthiness coefficients or something like that. But the context means not just culture dependent, but context dependent. So for example, when you're giving a Nobel Prize, I gave the Nobel Prize yesterday or the day before to two game theorists, they did very well on that. But it's merit that you count, right? You don't give a Nobel Prize because somebody needs the money. You know, give the Nobel Prize because you think these are the guys that deserve it on merit, right? On the other hand, you know, if you went out, went out in the street and um, you found hungry people, you would give it whatever you got to whoever you found most needy. So sometimes it's who needs it, sometimes who deserves it, you know, sometimes um, it's who put in the most effort. And uh, all of these are different contexts. 
So I'll show you, I'll just show you just some pictures. Oh yeah, so where did the standard of interpersonal comparison come from? Where does this slope come from? Why this slope and not some other slope? And um, the answer is that, uh, or my answer is that uh, this is determined not by uh, biology, but by um, cultural evolution. And it works not just for the egalitarian case that I'm considering, but also for utilitarianism. So I'll, show you, I'll just show you some pictures. So here is this white region I showed you before. Here is where we are now. An egalitarian would say, well, you know, given we know the standard of interpersonal comparison, given we know the social indices, we can work out this slope. And uh, this is the egalitarian outcome. The utilitarian outcome here, you notice, is far away. If we change the standard of interpersonal comparison, we change where these points are. Um, they can even be at the same place. And in fact, that's quite important in my theory, but I haven't got time for that. It happens that the Nash bargaining solution is then at the same place. And uh, so, um, so I'm arguing here, there's a strong analogy with language. Fairness norms um, have a common deep structure, just like language. But the standard of interpersonal comparison that is necessary as an input is culturally determined. So on language, you know, um, Chomsky argues that um, all languages have a common deep structure. But you know, if you're brought up in Japan, you learn Japanese. If you're brought up in China, you learn Chinese. If you're brought up in France, you learn French. So the, the actual language is not the same because there's a cultural element, element and there's a biological element. And you need both working together. So this is another big no-no. I mean, uh, because of the cultural element, um, this theory is necessarily relativistic. Two people in different societies will not say that the same thing is fair. And if you don't believe this, um, uh, there, there is books. This is the best book, I think, Jan Elster I mentioned earlier in talking about Sweden, his book, Local Justice. But usually people uh, argue that um, it's the deep structure that varies from place to place, what I argue. So deep structure is always the same. And what varies is the standard of comparison. Um, and I mentioned all, you know, the, you know, the standard of interpersonal comparison depends depending on the circumstances, need, ability, effort, status. And in my theory, these social indices always respond to these parameters in the same way, but the degree of response varies with the society's history. So if my theory is correct, you know, you waste your time it's just saying what is fair and what is not fair on the theoretical grounds. You really have to look at history. You have to look at culture. You have to do, um, you have to do what psychologists do, study people in, in the laboratory. Um, I'll just say very um, quick things about reform. Um, this, is a, this is the uh, Thomas More's Utopia that I'm showing you here. And, um, um, I tried very hard, you know, after I did the big auction, I was famous for a while. You know, everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame. And I wanted to do some good in the world, so I offered my services to the Department of Health. And I was so disillusioned, so um, unhappy with it all. I really wanted these guys to, um, to um, incorporate these notions of fairness into you know, how we deal with um, healthcare. You know, at, at the time, um, there was an anti-rationing society which was in favor of no rationing in health at all. Everybody should get what they want on demand. You know? So if everybody needed a heart operation, everybody gets one. It was ridiculous because there's enough money to pay for it. And my view is that um, you know, people will put up with rationing as long as they think it's fair. But how do you compare you know, someone having a very expensive heart operation with, say, 20 old ladies getting a hip operation? You know, that's the kind of comparisons that need to be made. And it's no use some Whitehall person, some government person, making that decision for us, because we, we, we don't accept that from those guys. We, we, we've got our own views about what's fair, and nobody's <coughs> going to persuade us otherwise. Um, and uh, if we want to do things fairly, we have to do surveys. But you have to ask people the question, you know, what do you think? Should these 20 old ladies get a hip operation or should this guy get a, uh, get a heart operation? 
Anyway, here are the points I want to make. Utop utopian reason is counterproductive. That's what I was just saying. Um, you've got to be practical. And um, people say to people like me, um, who are not metaphysicians, they say, you know, where is your source of authority? You know, where, where is your um, burning bush? Where, where, is this, where are your tablets brought down from the mountain? And my answer is, well, I haven't got any. You know, I don't have a burning bush, I don't have any authority, I don't have any stone tablets, and nor do you. And nor do you, and nor does anybody. There wasn't a burning bush, there weren't any stone tablets. Right? This is all made up, and the metaphysicians make it up as well. You know? They don't have any authority, nor do I, and nor does anybody else. You don't need any authority to reform. All you need is enough people, near enough the levers of power, who are willing to pull together. And if there's enough of us, we can do it. If we don't like what they're doing, we vote them out. Uh, we mustn't pretend that power does not matter. You know, there's no use just, uh, like I said earlier, shouting fair, be fair from the pulpit. It's a waste of time. And fairness norms are egalitarian. The fairness norms that are built into us are egalitarian, they're not utilitarian. And people make, this is what I was saying, people make their own welfare comparisons, not the, not the comparisons we want them to make. Make their own comparisons. And that's it. That's it. You've been very patient with me and I, I appreciate it.